Number one money good job. Even if I had this thing, I'm not sure I would give it to you. Hang on a minute. Who is this Ryan of Godsley? He's um, the star of this new Netflix movie. Never heard of him. Why couldn't they have cast more? Well, I mean, look at you. You're, you're a T-Rex. You were perfect in Jurassic Park, but this, I'm not so sure. Ugh, I've been typecast, I tell you. Typecast. I mean, what do you expect? You're hardly a chameleon. But darling, I was in heat too, Jurassic Heist. Listen, nobody was fooled by the balaclava, okay? Don't you know I'm a Shakespearean actor? Everyone in New York came to see my fabulous performance as Hamlet for Shakespeare in the Park. Your so-called high society friends only went because you threatened to eat them all if they didn't. Ha! <laughs> It's not my fault you humans pair so well with the lovely Chianti. Listen, can you stop talking? I'm trying to watch this, okay? He's got an interesting looking watch. I want to see what it is. That does look rather spiffy. You should do a video about it on your little YouTube's channel. Perhaps I could model it for you. The movie The Grey Man happens to be one of the most expensive Netflix productions to date at a staggering budget of $200 million. But also this happens to coincide with the inclusion of Tag Heuer on the wrist of their newest brand ambassador, the star of the movie Ryan Gosling. And if you have not seen my previous video about his many watches from Rolex to Casio, he is no stranger to sporting some really cool and horologically interesting choices. But was his tag hire featured in the movie a fitting choice for the character, the brand and the actor himself, compared to his previous watches? Well today we return to one of my most favourite series on this channel of watches in movies, so don't forget to click like to support more independent and free content like this, and also don't forget to share with your friends. Let's get into it. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And as we are discussing a brand synonymous with motor racing, I thought I'd wear one of my favorite affordable racing chronographs. This is Dan Henry, 1962. And I've put it on the Fluco Nizza strap, one of my favorite suede straps. Uh, it's just incredibly comfortable. And I love its kind of casual suede style. Already going off on a tangent, but anyway, uh, I got this from Holborns, so there we go. The Grey Man is a 2022 Netflix production and an adaptation of the 2009 book of the same name. In fact, it's a whole franchise of books written by Mark Greeney, who is best known as Tom Clancy's collaborator during his final books of his lifetime. Most notably, he helped continue the Jack Ryan character as well as the Tom Clancy universe following Clancy's death in 2013. The famed espionage writer Tom Clancy has very much become a household name due to a ton of commercial success ranging from books to movies to computer games and so on. So as you can imagine, we get a very similar style and themed movie here as a result but perhaps a little slicker and louder due to the direction of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movie directors, the famed Russo brothers. They have something they really want. What's your gut? It's gonna be my funeral you're going to next. You wanna make an omelet? You gotta kill some people. The actual titular Grey Man refers to Ryan Gosling's character called Sierra Six, a convicted killer turned assassin in an unofficial recruitment program known as the Sierra Program. As the name implies, the Grey Man falls between the gaps in terms of the black and white accountability, thus giving the CIA the ability to whack whoever they want with very little risk and cost to them via these disposable convicts who would have otherwise just languished in jail. Without getting into spoilers, inevitably it all goes a bit Pete Tong when those in charge of the Sierra Six become corrupt and start using these killers for their own nefarious gains, 
rather than taking out enemies of state. Gosling's character Six, now a super experienced hitman for over 18 years in the program, gets wise to this during the opening mission of the movie and turns on his dishonorable CIA bosses. He seeks help from his CIA recruiter and former spy master who is now retired, a chap called Donald Fitzroy, played by Billy Bob Thornton with his typical trustworthy good old boy southern charm. What follows is a cat and mouse game of explosive chases, super choreographed combat and spectacular stunts. The now corrupted CIA then bring in a mercenary called Lloyd Hansen to clean house. Hey sunshine. Mm, you must be Lloyd. What gave it away? The white pants, the trash dash, it just, it leans Lloyd. He becomes the movie's main villain who is also a former CIA agent but kicked out of the agency due to his psychopathic tendencies. Hansen is played quite memorably by Chris Evans of Marvel movie fame in a kind of subversion of his goody-goody typical Captain America role. So Evans does an absolutely masterful job here uh, of this utterly loathsome uh, kind of Oswald Mosley-esque pinky ring wearing <laughs> uh, villain here. Absolutely chewing the scenery, really great stuff. But just imagine that type, but injected with super capitalistic greed, solipsistic, il più grande stronzo puoi immaginare questo qua. Oh, and by the way, guys, look out for a little appearance by Wagner Mura, uh, who famously played Pablo Escobar in Narcos. Great, great show, but here he's almost unrecognizable. The film as a whole works effectively. It's easy to follow and refreshingly never gets bogged down in clunky exposition or overly convoluted plot, which is unfortunately all too common these days. It manages to keep you thoroughly entertained, I quote Mark Commode, as much as big dumb fun can. Its drawbacks, however, are its cliched predictability, lack of any depth whatsoever, and overzealous drone shots, which actually kept taking me out of the movie at times. We get it, just because you can get these lavish aerial shots these days with drones that were impossible before with helicopters does not mean we need them every few minutes. Surprisingly, Tag is the only watch brand that has been included in multiple spy movie franchises most famously was on the wrist of James Bond via Timothy Dalton in The Living Daylights with his uber stealthy blacked out PVD coated Hoyer 1000 diver, but also in the earlier Jason Bourne movies with the Tag Hoyer link on Matt Damon's wrist. So while James Bond has Amiga now, Jack Ryan has Hamilton, Mission Impossible's Ethan Hawke with various Casios and Tudors, The Grey Man solidifies Tag as the most worn watch brand in the espionage movie genre. Not an achievement I expected, but nonetheless, here we are. The watch chosen in The Grey Man was the Tag Heuer Carrera Date automatic with a silver sunburst dial and a crowd-pleasing 39mm diameter size. This classically looking and relatively simple three-hander has its design language deeply influenced by the heyday of Hoyer's automotive timepieces that very much was what the brand is renowned for and still is to this day. But unlike their most cinematically iconic chronographs, this cleaner and therefore dressier look was chosen specifically to complement Gosling, an actor that already undoubtedly has become something of a style icon, both on and off screen. In fact, the tag advertising highlights this point perfectly, elegant enough for Sierra 6's dapper attire, but tough enough to deal with any car or plane crashes because of course we're going to have the inevitable car chase. So what makes Gosling such a fantastic watch ambassador is, well if you missed my video on his collection I did donkeys years ago, he knows when to wear the right watch with the right sartorial setup and also the right situation. He wears the iconic Casio A168W1 when he's playing with his band, a functional robust selection for dealing with the magnetic fields of musical equipment. His most famous watch is his mid-century vintage Rolex Air King, which, despite its modest 34mm size, he wears with great confidence in more formal situations. Again, absolute perfection. It has an understated old-world sophistication, a subtle bit of sprezzatura 
that is seldom seen in today's more TikTok culture of overly casual hipster aesthetics that looks like you just rolled out of a bed in an overpriced Williamsburg apartment. Now I have to confess that at first I did think the tag Carrera was a little oversized, but I think that's mainly because I was just so used to seeing him with the previously mentioned choices. Going with the silver dial variation over the royal blue dial or black with rose gold applied markers, I feel was a clever decision too, that further enhanced its strap monster compatibility. Now I'm not sure if TAG produce kind of a NATO style or a Zulu uh, style strap, but it would be really cool. I'm just imagine if he wore it on a Risk County Watch Club uh, nylon strap that I co-designed. I mean, yeah, that would be, <laughs> that would be amazing, right? TAG, call me, let's make it happen for the next one. My only critiques here are that I would have preferred to see him wear the chronograph version of the Carrera. And like in the video I made about George Clooney with his Amiga Speedmaster in the underrated espionage movie, The American, I would have liked to see Sierra 6 use the complication as a tool as part of the plot, something that the American did so effectively and made that product placement very believable. Muzzle velocity. About 360 miles an hour. That's including 20 miles an hour off the sound suppression. That still remains one of the best brand, actor, movie product placement and believable watch castings in all of movie history in my opinion. Also the Carrera Chrono is arguably one of their most famed models and the 39mm silver version of their recent red dial limited edition would have been an absolute hit with collectors too I feel. To further enhance the military utility of the tag, being worn on a water resistant nylon NATO style strap would have elevated its tactical robustness, especially in the case of a spring bar malfunction, which could have easily happened while jumping out of exploding windows or fist fighting villainous enemy goons. Another important point to observe is the physicality of Ryan Gosling. He is able to bring quite a masculine, physically capable presence. He is quite intimidating without overcompensating while still being able to pull off a relatively refined, well, I think it's quite a refined watch. It is a bit of a reflection of him in a certain regard. Despite what one thinks of the Grey Man movie, even if you loved or loathed it, one cannot deny Gosling is a great actor. Being a massive fan of Danish cinema, I loved his collaborations with Nicholas Winding Refn that really proved there was far more range than his more mainstream romantic comedies that made him a household name. Sometimes it's an actor's ability to emote effectively by doing less that can really bring so much to a role. Speaking of comedy, in Shane Black's overlooked gem, The Nice Guys, he also demonstrated his comedic chops too, something that was utilized sparingly but well as Sierra 6. Look away. You know there's a mirror here, right? Close your eyes. One thing, however, that he is most adept at doing is the archetypal so-called strong and silent type of classic American cinema. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper, the strong, silent type? That was an American. A tradition that goes way back, that has roots in the Gary Cooper and Clint Eastwood westerns, along with Akira Kurosawa movies with Toshiro Mifune. A throwback to when movie stars were actually movie stars, based on talent, hard work, and most often blessed with some kind of ineffable special something. Not just the vapid overnight TikTok or Kardashian style fame we sadly see today. Again, The Grey Man touches on this, but in an action movie context, reminiscent of the king of cool Chow Young Fat in the Capolavoro Hard Boiled, this classic stoic badassness, if that is even a word, naturally reflects onto the watch. This is, after all, the whole point of a watch ambassador. While it will never eclipse the verisimilitude of an actor's personal choice off and on screen, the best example being the Seiko Ani appearing in five movies, as well as a whole period of Schwarzenegger's personal life, it will always work better than the more forced or miscast brand collaborations like Tudor and Lady Gaga, for example.
Where else could you see Bon Jovi, Madame Gaga, and the Cold Play under one roof? <laughs> That's perfect. Now, has anyone noticed how Lady Gaga has disappeared from the Tudor website, their list of ambassadors? Anyone notice that? I mean, look at the website. It's as if it never happened. So I've got to say, it is a really handsome watch. I love the balance of the dial, the date placement at the six. There's very strong lines of symmetry here. It's very mature. It's a very grown up watch, so to speak. Obviously, I would have loved it to be 36 millimeter, a smidgen smaller, but that's just my personal preference for most people be absolutely fine. Definitely got that design language. It just screams Carrera. The biggest issue, and I, I'm gonna see it in the comments, I know people are gonna complain about the price. For this kind of money, you're entering into Tudor territory, Amiga territory, Fortis, Hanhart, Zinn. That is some stiff competition. Companies like this that offer a lot more for the same money. So yeah, value-wise, it's not the best deal in the world but now of course it's been immortalized well on the silver screen forever so it's got a little bit of magic that other brands you know would kill to have of course tag can afford to do this while this product placement will turn many off i think with such a mainstream movie with a relatively affordable timepiece compared to most swiss watch brands that is but also more importantly a classically tasteful watch in a world where every other watch I see is another soulless, cookie-cutter, pedestrian Apple Watch, I praise Tag and Netflix for this move. Now, Tag has always had its own detractors in the watch world too, but speaking as a person who has physically been inside their factory in Switzerland and their immense collection of historic watches housed in their fantastic museum and seen all of this firsthand, I have nothing but respect for them, especially when you consider this isn't another oversized watch trying to be a smart watch, which unfortunately has been a bit of an obsession of theirs in the last few years. But this, however, is a 39mm automatic, so really refreshing there. Now, one side note before we end today's episode is that I couldn't help noticing Ana de Armas was kind of underused in this movie, much like her magnificent but brief no time to die appearance. It would have been really great to see her sporting a cool timepiece, maybe a men's diver, as a cheeky nod to the groundbreaking way a Rolex Submariner was worn way ahead of its time by Vanessa Redgrave in Michelangelo Antonioni's 1966 masterpiece, Blow Up. But then again, she's not officially an ambassador for the brand, so I guess that's why. But it would be nice to see more strong, confident women wearing cool watches as well. Nobody can ever say that this is bad taste. And in a world where, you know, even in cinema, you're seeing smartwatches, smartwatches everywhere, seeing something serious from a brand, a heritage brand like this, yeah, I absolutely support it 100%. Okay, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Massive thank you to Moya Fine Jewelers for lending this tag in. They are, of course, authorized dealers for tag. Oh, and also, guys, don't forget to like this video. Very important indeed if you want to see more free, independent content like this. It's the best way to support the channel. Opinions, thoughts, uh, what do you think about the watch? Other movies you'd like me to investigate or watches in movies? Your nominations down below. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Onwards and up and I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.